Now then. Hey ho! We're back! back. <laughs> we are back and we are ready to film our next episode. We know it's been a really tough couple of months with COVID and coronavirus and everything that's going on, but we are back and so excited to get back to it. So we have been dropping hints over the last couple of weeks as to where we might be and what we might be doing. So, Tom, would you like to tell them what we have planned? Absolutely, Rosie. So we are back at it, like Rosie says, and we are in South Yorkshire at the RSPB's Dern Valley Old Moor Reserve. We're really excited to be here. Um, the site is absolutely fantastic for wildlife experiences, for families, for just getting out and about and enjoying wildlife and nature. It's also a very exciting time for the site and for us as well, because this place is so good that it's been chosen by the BBC to film this year's Autumn Watch. So we're going to be trying to bring you a little bit, a little bit from behind the scenes there, fingers crossed, but mainly we are here to show you what fantastic opportunities to see wildlife and nature this site can bring you. So, without further ado, let's have a look what's coming up. Looking good, Rosie. I'm so excited. Let's get shooting. The Dern Valley has a really rich history in mining heritage. There's been mining here since the 1700s and that continued on until the 1980s and early 1990s. By the 1950s there were 32,000 colliers employed in the area and a lot of the sites that the RSPB manage in the area including Oldmore have links to that heritage. Locally Wathings which was a mine um, for, for many many years in the 1930s that mine shaft collapsed creating a body of water and that was one of the first areas to fill with water and become what we now know as a nature reserve. Oldmore itself was actually not one of the mines but it was an area where in the 90s they were trying to create a much nicer greener space because this area had been completely decimated of any wildlife due to the mining history. Um, and what happened on Oldmore site itself was that it was a site where they took an awful lot of topsoil from the area to spread around locally to help tree growth and manage it that way. So the site is now an absolutely fantastic wetland. So there's mixed habitats here. We've got reed beds, we've got wet meadows, we've got woodland and there's a little bit of moorland heading up out towards the outskirting areas as well. So the site itself is absolutely fantastic for families, for local naturalists and for um, people who just want to come and get out and about. In terms of key species, with it being a wetland, it is a really, really fantastic spot for waders, for things like egrets. There are bitten on here as well, which is a really, really crucial species because it was a species that was on the brink of extinction in the 1990s. We now have them breeding here on the reed beds. Out further afield on the reserve here, we've got a tree sparrow colony, which is absolutely fabulous. And there are also brings opportunities for things like your raptors. In terms of raptor species, we also have marsh harry visiting the site. They come from other wetland areas, but we do know that they have bred here as well. So there has been marsh harrier nests, which is absolutely superb. So in terms of your visit at the site and what facilities are available, the site is absolutely fantastic for anyone who wants to visit. So in terms of facilities, there are toilets available on site. Um, there are disabled toilets and there is also the availability of a hoist should you need it. Um, 
there is a cafe which is absolutely lovely serving hot and cold food and within the visitor center itself there's a really substantial shop so you can get a little bit of retail therapy into your visit as well in terms of the site itself there is a hive specifically put there for families to enjoy so if you're worried about the children being a little bit noisy about people enjoying the quiet and wildlife and nature it's not a worry you should really have but you have got the family hide there and it is fantastic we'll probably go have a little look at that later on dispersed around the site there are a number of hides and the site itself is not absolutely huge so you don't have to walk an awfully long way to really experience the wildlife and nature around you all of the paths are accessible and there is scooter hire available here as well so there's something for everybody but i would certainly being a family man encourage you to get down here with the kids with the family and just see what this place has got to offer i'm going to check it out now So I'm here with Lydia, who works here at RSPB Oldmore. Um, thanks for joining us, Lydia, at a nice social distance. Yep, Because no of the current off. times. Um, so Lydia, got a couple of questions for you. What, obviously the site here is a real, really important site in terms of species coming in, yep. um, being a part of that corridor of conservation locally. We've got all to watch here, which yeah. is really, really exciting. Um, what is it you think that drew them to the site? Well, Speaking to the team here since they've arrived, um, I think, and, and one of my reasons that I think this site is so very, very special is actually the history of the site and that that whole story about how, you know, this site was dur during the war, during the wars between the wars used as a coal store. It was essentially ecologically dead, and then now you look around and we've got some of our most threatened and endangered and special species breathing here and use it as a home. Things like the bittern and the marsh harrier, bearded tits, you know, the work that the RSPB and partners have done, not just here at Old Moor, but along the Dern Valley, has created this extraordinary space in an ex, uh, an ex industrial area that is now surrounded by distribution warehouses um, and um, kind of that post-industrial kind of um, space that, that we know so well off the M1 and the A1 here and we've got this little oasis. And I think that's it's exciting isn't it it's yeah. an exciting sort of thing to have it's one of those gateway sites really is. in a really industrial and sort of really industrial area it's yeah. absolutely fantastic so what we really want people to do is get, get here and come and visit and see it for themselves yeah. um, I like to focus on family things. Obviously, it's great for, for, for naturalists, people that love the wildlife and nature. It's also a fantastic site for families. What would you say your sort of top tips are for your visits and where would you like to see people sort of visit it? Well, obviously, as a grown-up, one of my favourite things still to do on Old Moor is pond dipping. It's a classic. I absolutely love exploring all the creatures that live underneath the water. And, I mean, in terms of kind of why the wildlife is here that is also really important you know all the invertebrates and the little fish and the amphibians that live in the wet bits of the reserve are all part of the food chain and it's a great fun to explore some of that but then we've got classic things like the sensory garden things that you can go and touch and smell and feel and, and listen to and then we've got um obviously the, the wild play area as well and the new stuff that we've got coming up as well in the next year or so is going to be so exciting as part of the nlhf project that we've got going on on site as well it is i mean being out on nature is brilliant for kids and families anyway, in my opinion. Um, nature is exciting and interesting on its own, but we've got loads of stuff here just to help families to interpret that nature and, and get the most out of the visits as well. Why would you not want to visit here? Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk to us, Lydia. No problem, I know you're really busy, so we really appreciate it. See you soon. See you soon.
so we've just come out to a, a very quiet spot on the reserve um and we're just gonna ask our rosie some stuff about her filming techniques so rosie what are you doing now so currently i'm just getting some nice shots of the flyer garricks that we've got here um this one that i'm shooting here is like the most perfect example of a flyer garrick or toadstool as they're most commonly known um so yeah that's what i'm filming at the minute lovely stuff and Tell us a little bit about your techniques, what techniques you like to use, a bit about your photography, what, what, because I'm not the photographer, I don't know what I'm talking about, but just to let people know about some of your techniques and what you like to do. Yeah, so whenever I'm filming a subject, I, it's very different with plants, obviously they don't move, but I try and get as low to the ground as I possibly can, um, because I don't like looking down on a subject, it just gives a really funny perspective, so as level as I can with them is always really good. So like I said, with this flyer garret here, it's not going anywhere, so I can move around it as freely as I can. Um, however, if this was a, a, you know, an animal or anything like that, I'd make sure that I'm taking extra care not to disturb it, stay out of the way, stuff like that. But um, for me to get a lot of the habitat, obviously with a wide angle lens, you get to see the habitat itself, but with a longer lens, you're putting that out. So I'm using my longer lens here so I can get detail, however, getting lower i get the foreground in it as well so that can just add some more color and a bit more perspective about what i'm actually shooting so yeah nice and your best con what are your best conditions for filming what what's what's your optimum filming day like so it depends um i guess obviously getting out sunrise sunset for those colors is amazing especially for autumn um, and you get all the mist traveling up from any water as well so um, something like this right now, we've got a bit of cloud cover and actually I'm really pleased with that because it offers a really soft, even lighting. It's like using a giant softbox basically. So everything's even um, it, and it just looks lovely. I don't like harsh light. Um, and again, woodland can be really tricky for that. If you're getting really harsh sunlight coming through in different spots, it, it, can, it can ruin a shoot, I think so. For me, this lighting is, is really good. Nice one. Right, well, I let my, better let you crack on, aren't I? I'll be quiet, leave it to your shooting. <laughs> so this rain was unexpected today, guys. Um, it was supposed to be sunshine and light cloud all day, but we're gonna adapt and just see what happens in the next few minutes. <laughs> pushing for a career in wildlife filmmaking, I wanted to chat to one of the best in the industry. And who better to chat to than TV presenter and naturalist Gillian Burke. Gillian is here presenting one quarter of Autumn Watch 2020 and here's what happened when we had a catch up with her. Gillian, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule. We know how much you've got on at the minute. We just wanted to ask you a few questions today about the industry and things, if that's all right to us. So how do you think nature documentaries have sort of progressed throughout the years is it the same message as when it started all those years ago with david Attenborough and to now wow do you know when i started on the watches even that was like three years ago um i i decided to do this because i thought this is the only platform that i knew of in british tv that would regularly put in amongst you know the lovely items about you know, natural you know that will satisfy the naturalists and also the hard science as well but in amongst that there was some conservation and environmental items as well and I was like well I don't know where anywhere else that's doing that and even in the short time since I've been doing this I think things have changed a lot in the industry um, there's there's just more awareness I think the urgency as well and the challenges we're facing and climate you know, well two sides of the same point right climate and ecological crisis and extinction crisis I think that urgency is really being felt now 
and that's changing the narrative. It's changing the sort of stories we want to tell and how we tell them. Yeah, it's so interesting. You can, you can see it, you can see how it's yeah. changing. I guess some people, you know, would like it to have to be more, but, you know, I think that change is coming. Yeah, definitely. So as we're filming this, we are currently about to go into lockdown number two because yeah. of COVID, <laughs> coronavirus. So going through the first lockdown, it was clear that nature had quite a big impact on a lot of us and us on it. What do you think that impact was and do you think that our attitude to nature is changing because of us experiencing it? Well, I would say emphatically yes. <laughs> you know, the spring lockdown was like this big you know unplanned and hopefully you know well at the time I would say hopefully never to happen again obviously it is um experiment I guess um where virtually the whole world came to a standstill and I think the first really noticeable thing was the sound you know as the cities fell silent traffic all of that and we started to hear the natural world around us and I think even in really urban areas people still had that connection with birdsong, you may not be able to see it, know where it's coming from or what you're singing, but you hear it. And that was, I think, a really, really powerful experience for people. And it's interesting, standing here right now, I can hear there's some construction work going, there's a busy road. You know, we are a noisy species, a really noisy species. So on that count alone, just noise pollution, the spring lockdown brought that experience. And I think that was a really universal experience right across the board, irrespective of where you were. Um, autumn is going to be different. It's a challenge because it's not as at, you know out there. You know, nature's not in full swing as it is in spring, or at least it isn't in a visible and audible way. And the part of me sort of thinks, well, maybe we need to take a little bit of a cue, or you know, take a cue from nature in the autumn lockdown now, which is to sort of really, I guess, surrender to just slowing down really kind of going in that introspection it's hard work <laughs> Trust yeah. me. so but but that's possibly you know one way to get through this like to really treat this as, a, as an opportunity if we can it's tough i'm not saying it's going to be easy but to just try and restore slow down yeah. and where possible rest yeah because that's a huge one for, for everyone for well-being for mental health um a really simple thing is resting <laughs> and that's it, just that self-care and just making sure that we enjoy and appreciate all the nature that we have to offer. So you have been in South Yorkshire and Yorkshire in general before for Spring Watch last year. So in terms of location, do you did you choose to come back here or did somebody send you here? How does that work? Well, it's a team effort. I mean, I, I would love to think that I get to call the shots. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Um, I think the feeling after Spring Watch, where we all stayed very close, all the presenters stayed very close to home. Well, you know, Chris literally from his home, I stayed in Cornwall. Um, I think the feeling was when we thought we'd have fewer restrictions in the autumn, that it would be nice to represent different parts of the country that didn't get a look in in Spring Watch. I, as you said, I've been here before for Spring Watch 2018. I loved it. I, I sort of came to this reserve at Old Moor and St. Aidan's and Fairburning, so those three reserves. I've been back since a few times and I just I just love telling the story here. For me, it is like one of the most hopeful stories that I came across. As, you know, so back in 2018, I used to love saying things like, oh, nature could bounce back and it can heal itself and it's got this amazing power. And if I'm honest, like I said it because I really wanted it to be true. But when I did those items back in the spring 2018, that was like the first real evidence I had of that. And I was like, oh wow, I can believe the hype now. My own hype, this is real and it can happen. So I think it's one of the, my favorite things. So when they told me I was coming here, I was just like, yes, I am done with that. I'm really, yeah, I'm really excited about it. Oh, good. Well, we were really glad for you to come back. We were really excited. Um, and finally, what up to this point, what has been your highlight of autumn of 2020? Oh. It's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> True. And we are still working to maybe catch a sight of fittings in quite an unusual way. I'm not sure I'm allowed to say. <laughs> so that's it. Leave it at that. A tease. That's really exciting. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so, so much for chatting to us. We know, like I said, you're, you're very busy. But yeah, we've loved it. Big virtual hug. I know, Cheers. literally, at two meters. <laughs> um, good luck with the rest of the show. And yeah, look after yourself. So. You too. Stay safe. You do. Bye.
Being here at RSPB Oldmore, you're obviously going to have loads of opportunities to see all sorts of different birds. It's not just about the wetland birds, it's a mixed habitat here and there are great opportunities to see some fantastic garden birds as well. As you come away from the visitor centre onto the site itself, there's a great spot called the Tree Sparrow Farm and we're going to head up there to have a little look at what it has to offer. This is a great opportunity for us also to talk about the RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch, which is not too far away, it's coming up in January. And this year, um, in, the, in the 2020 edition of the Big Garden Bird Watch, uh, we had some really, really great spots. So coming in at number one was the house sparrow. So house sparrows are doing relatively okay. Um, there was a big decline, um, but they are starting to come up a little bit in numbers now. Number two is the starling. Trouble there with for the starling, about 75% decline over the last 25, 30 years. Number three, Everyone's favourite, the blue tit. Blue tits seem to be doing really well in our gardens. Number four is the wood pigeon. Number five is the blackbird. Number six is the goldfinch. Seven, the great tit. Number eight, the robin. And number nine, the long-tailed tit. So long-tailed tits seem to be increasing in numbers across the UK. And it's a great opportunity to see them in your garden. They come in big groups, so they stay in familial groups. So when you see one, you're almost guaranteed to see more along the way. And number 10, not everybody's favourite, but I love them. It's a Corvid species, the magpie. So I'm going to head up to the tree sparrow farm now to see what we can see here on the site. us to the end of this episode coming to you from RSPB Oldmore. We would just like to say a massive thank you to all the RSPB staff for allowing us to come here and film this beautiful site and a massive thank you again to Gillian for spending some time with us and answering those questions. Indeed we were an awesome time guys making this episode. Um, don't forget to like, subscribe, tap the notification bell and share the films with everybody and we will see you again next time. Into one. See you soon.